Welcome to Dimensions of Prophecy, a fantastic journey through Scripture. Tonight, our speaker, Kenneth Cox, will study with us Revelation chapter 13. In this exciting chapter of the Apocalypse, we find two great beasts. There's a leopard-like beast and a two-horned beast. Both are carefully detailed in Scripture. Tonight's presentation will focus on the two-horned beast. The Bible clearly identifies this beast as the United States of America. Together, we'll see how this great nation has entered into the overall plan of God on this earth. Pastor Cox will tell of present developments of historical and eternal significance, and just how God's hand has directed and continues to lead this nation. God has given dramatic warnings to the people of the United States today, warnings you need to hear. Stay tuned as we go directly to the meeting in progress for tonight's important and thrilling presentation, The United States in Bible Prophecy. There's never been a nation since the beginning of time that's been as blessed by God as the United States of America. Actually, Israel, in the height of the reign of David and Solomon, never experienced the blessings that you have had the privilege of experiencing. The United States is a nation that has been blessed by God in a very special way. And this morning, we're going to take a look and see what the Scripture says about this country. I'd like for you to notice what it says in Amos, the third chapter, and verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So it says clearly that God is going to reveal to his servants, the prophets, things that are to take place, things that are going to happen. And he's talked about nation after nation after nation down through time. Abraham Lincoln, in his famous Cooper of the Union address on the eve of the Civil War, made a statement, and I want you to listen to that statement very carefully because that statement expresses the exact purpose of Bible prophecy. Notice what it says. If we could first tell where we are, and whether we are tending, we could tell better what to do and how to do it. That's the exact purpose of prophecy, to tell you and I where we are in the stream of time, where we're headed, where we're tending, that you and I might know what we ought to do and how we ought to go about doing it. That is the purpose of Bible prophecy. And as we study prophecy from night to night, we want to see how God is leading step by step down through time right up to our present day and in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, you'll find that many, many great nations are mentioned in Scripture. For instance, we'll be talking about the nation of Egypt. God had a lot to say about Egypt, the part that it has played. Last night, we talked about nations such as Babylon. We took a look at other nations such as Greece, Medo-Persia. We studied last night about Rome and what the Scripture said about Rome. And the United States is no exception. You find that God mentions this country in a very definite way in the book of Revelation. And so we're going to go to the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, we're going to take a look at two beasts. We're going to look at this first beast, a leopard-like beast. That's not the one that we're really concerned about, so we're not going to spend much time on him this morning. We'll take a look at that beast at another time and study all about it. But we want to take a look at the second beast, which is a two-horned beast. That's the one we want to look at this morning. You see, God uses beast to represent nation. That's what God used beast for. For instance, if you went over to Daniel, the eighth chapter, you'll find it says this. Daniel 8, verse 20, it says, The ram which you saw having two horns are the kings of what? Medo and Persia. So here God uses a ram to represent the nation of Medo Persia. The next verse, verse 21, simply says, And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So here God uses a goat to represent the kingdom of Greece. We do the same thing today. For instance, if you were to go home, pick up the newspaper, and turn over to the political cartoon, 
And let's say that you saw a lion and a bear and an eagle and a rooster all sitting around the conference table. Who would the lion represent? Yes, it'd represent England, Great Britain. Who would the bear represent? Russia. Who would the eagle represent? United States. Who would the rooster represent? Always gets quiet when I ask that one. <laughs> well, the rooster represents France. And so it would just mean these nations were sitting around the conference table, and God does the very same thing here. He uses beasts to represent nations, and we're going to look at these two beasts. Now, we're going to look at this first beast, but we're going to look at this first beast only for the purpose of setting a time sequence. That's the only reason we're looking at it, is to set the time sequence concerning the second beast. Now, notice what it says here in Revelation 13 in verse 1. And I stood on the sands of the sea, saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads the name of blasphemy. So it says that he sees this beast rising up out of the sea. The beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. So it tells us clearly here in God's Word that this beast was like a leopard, it had the feet of a bear, it had the mouth of a lion, and a dragon had given to this beast its power, its seat, its authority. Now it continues talking about this beast, and it talks about the fall of this beast, and that's the next text I want to go to in Revelation, the 13th chapter. And it says here in verse 10, He who leads into captivity. Now, this beast had led people into captivity. So it says, He that leadeth into captivity must go into what? Captivity. So it says that that beast was going to go into captivity. He who kills with the sword, and that power had must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So it says that this beast was going to go into captivity. It had killed with the sword, that it would be killed with the sword. Now, if you look at history, and I'm not going to make any effort this morning, folks, don't expect me to, to identify that first beast. I'm not going to identify it. All I'm going to do is set a time sequence. That's all I'm going to do here this morning. All right, at a given time, this power was in, or this beast was in power. It was ruling the world. Last night, I spoke about a man by the name of Napoleon. Napoleon, I read a statement to you where he wanted to rule the world. He realized he could not do it unless he could break the back of this power because this power was in rule and Napoleon knew that he could never control unless he broke the power of that beast. You'll find that Napoleon did that in 1798. He overthrew this beast power. Now, all I'm trying to do here is set a time sequence, and I want you to get it clear in your mind that Napoleon overthrew this beast power in the year 1798. Now, there was a great preacher in the past by the name of John Wesley. Are you acquainted with John Wesley? You know who I'm talking about. He's the one, the great English preacher, even came over here to the United States, spent some time, and really was the founder or the backbone of the Methodist Church, a tremendous preacher. John Wesley wrote a book called Notes on Revelation. Now, all it was... It's just notes that John Wesley had written about different verses in the book of Revelation. That was put together and published. That was published in 1754. Clear with me? 1754. This power was taken into captivity in 1798. Now, I want you to listen to what John Wesley says about these two beasts, about this first beast and about the two-horned beast that we're going to be studying. Listen to what John Wesley says about it. He is not yet come. 
talking about the two-horned beast that we're going to be studying. John Wesley in 1754 said, He is not yet come, though he cannot be far off. Get it clear. 1754. This man understood this book, folks. Don't think he didn't understand it. He knew exactly what was happening. He said that two-horned beast is not yet come, although he cannot be far off, for he is to appear at the end of the 42 months of the first beast. He said when the 42 months of this beast that the Scripture speaks about comes to an end, the two-horned beast must come up and he said he can't be far off, and that was written in 1754, and you'll find that at that time, the next beast is to arise. So are you beginning to get the time sequence in your mind? 1798, 1754, John Wesley says he can't be far off. Let's see what happens. Let's begin to put it together. You remember that our forefathers came over to these shores, and begin to settle. Now it says, I saw another beast. Revelation 13, verse 11. I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, spoke as a dragon. So it says, verse 10 that I read to you, he that leadeth into captivity must go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. So what I want you to see is as this first beast, the leopard-like beast, is going down into captivity. In verse 11, God says, I saw another beast coming up. Just exactly as one goes down, God said he saw the other one come up. This first beast went down in 1798. It says that this other beast is to come up. And you remember, the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, 1620. They begin to set up their lives there, set up civilization, begin to build towns and communities and so forth and their homes and all, and things went along fairly well. About a century passed. Now, they're under the control of England. Remember? When did that power go into captivity? 1798. Now, watch what happens. Declaration of Independence, 1776, okay? Constitution of the United States, 1787. Bill of Rights, 1789. The Bill of Rights is adopted, 1791. The beast power went into captivity, 1798. Let me tell you something, dear friends. There's not another power on earth that fits that time sequence. Now, they can talk all they want to, but that two-horned beast that we're studying about here that rose up as the one, the first one went down, only the United States fits that time sequence. Not another one. They can say all they want to about any other power but there's no other power on the face of the earth that fits into that time sequence. And John Wesley understood that absolutely clear when he said he is not yet come, but he can't be far off, for he is to appear at the end of the 42 months of that first beast. Only the United States fits that time sequence. There are several things that it says about this two-horned power. And that is, it says that it arose out of the what? The earth. All the other beasts that we study about, and we're going to be studying about these four beasts in Daniel 7, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the dragon. We're going to look at all those. Also, some other beasts here in Revelation. Those beasts rise up out of water. Not this beast. It rose up out of the earth. Now, you'll find that in the Bible, God uses water to represent nations, tongues, people. Listen to what it says here in Revelation 17, verse 15. And he said to me, the waters where you, which you saw, where the harlot sits, are peoples, multitudes, tongues, nations. So when it said that this beast would rise up out of the earth, it meant this would not be a country or a place that had been settled. 
It meant that it was going to rise up out of a place that basically civilization had not come in, it had not been settled, it would not take place as normally one nation after another that we talked about last night had come up. In fact, this country was settled just like it says on the Statue of Liberty. For it says there, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send them, the homeless, tempt us, toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. You see, your forefathers, my forefathers, came over to this country looking for a place that they could settle and that they could make a livelihood and they could carve out a future and that's how they came over here and that's how this nation came into being. It rose up out of the earth. All the other beasts rose up out of the sea. Definite difference in the two. But let's continue as it tells us more about this beast and it says, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth he had two horns like a lamb, spoke like a dragon. Now you'll find that many of the beasts in Scripture have horns on them. Those horns represent the type of power. Sometimes those horns will have crowns on them, meaning that that particular power will be ruled by a king, a monarch. Sometimes those horns don't have crowns meaning it's not going to be ruled by a king but by a house of representatives or a house of commons or a senate, this type of government. But those horns represent the very root and basis for that government's power. When our forefathers came over to this country, they had a different type of government in mind. They came over here and settled. Have you ever read and studied about the settlement of this country? Huh? Well, I can tell you, if you haven't, you need to. And I'm not talking about in your average history book. You find that the history books want to tell it a different story altogether, folks. I'm talking about the book you read in school. If that's all you're depending on is the book you read in school, let me tell you, your understanding of the history of this country has been distorted. I just want to tell you that right now. You were told that the problem here with our forefathers was one of taxation. That was not the problem. Was not a problem of taxation. Have you ever gone back and read it? Huh? Have you ever read the taxation that England was putting on us? Man, I would gladly accept it today with open arms. Any day. We put worse on ourselves than they put on us. That was not the problem. I want to show you what the problem was. Listen to what it says here. In 2 Samuel 23 and verse 3, our forefathers, when they came over here, they were basically, basically religious in their belief. Now, let's clarify that because some people don't understand. There were basically two colonies started up. One was called Jamestown and the other one was called Plymouth, okay? If you want to go back and read the story of Jamestown, Jamestown was not religious. The people that settled there were not religious. They were almost atheistic, and that place was wiped out three times. They just, it wouldn't go. They died from disease and everything else. Over in Plymouth Rock, they sailed in there, and they sailed in in the fall. And you and I need to go back, and like I told you last night, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, you go down to the library and check me out. They landed at Plymouth Rock. They found a village. Houses built, food there and everything and not a soul there. I'm talking about what they found at Plymouth Rock. If you don't believe me, go check the library. That place was there, the houses were there, food there, and they just moved in. God had already provided for them. Our forefathers that moved into Plymouth Rock were basic 
religiously religious in belief, and they took this text very, very serious. The God of Israel said to the rock of Israel, and the, excuse me, and the rock of Israel spoke to me, he who ruleth over men must be what? Just, and ruling in the fear of God. And they believed that with all their heart. They believed that if a man was going to go into politics, if he was going to be in public office, that one, he had to be just. And two, he had to rule in the fear of God. They believed that, and they said, this is what we believe, and this is what we will establish our belief on, and they stood on that firmly. England was not willing to go along with that. England was not ruling them justly, and secondly, they certainly was not ruling them in the fear of God, and our forefathers did not like it. And they rebelled over it. I can tell you it was not that they threw tea into the harbor at Boston. That was not the problem. That was only a symptom of the problem. The problem was right here. Listen, I want you to read some more of what our forefathers said about this. Patrick Henry, you remember Patrick Henry? Huh? Do you remember Patrick Henry? Do you remember what he said? Huh? Yeah, he said, give me liberty or give me death. What else did he say? You don't know, do you? Well, I want to read you some other things that he said. We shall not fight alone. God presides over the destiny of nations and will raise up friends for us. Listen, the battle is not to the strong alone. It's not to the vigilant. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Yeah, now, listen carefully. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Ah, now we're dealing with the problem. He said, is this what they're going to do to us? It wasn't taxation. It was the fact that they were not willing to let them rule justly and in the fear of God. And they said, no. He said, forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. We're dealing with the problem. Another one of your forefathers that you aren't very well acquainted, a man by the name of Josiah Quincy, he had this to say. In defense of our, come on, our civil and religious. There's, dear friends, the problem. In defense of our civil and religious rights, with the God of army on our side, we fear not the hour of trial. Though the host of our enemy should cover the field like locusts, yet the sword of the Lord and Gideon shall prevail. Dear friends, there are the two horns of that beast. Civil and religious rights. You see, our forefathers came over here and they said, listen, we want a country without a king. We don't want a monarch. We want government by the people, for the people, and through the people. They said, secondly, we want to give to every man and woman the right to worship according to the dictates of their own conscience and on those two principles, this country was established, and that's what those two horns on that lamb represents. They happen to be the secret of the prosperity of this country, and God help us if we give them up. That is what it's talking about. That's what made the country unique, and that's what will keep us if we will do what God called us to do. Very clearly. There are certain things that are happening, changes that are taking place, changes that concern me. I wish that this text stopped there. I wish it didn't say any more. I wish it didn't say that it had two horns like a lamb and then it goes on and says it spake as a dragon. I wish it didn't say that. I wish the scripture stopped right there. But it doesn't. It says that this power, this lamb-like beast, 
is going to speak as a dragon. If you don't know what's been happening for the last, oh, 15, 20 years, I'd like to tell you, we happen to be living at a time in which this power is changing character. We're going from lamb-like to dragon. And all you got to do is look at what's happening, and you can see it. And I'm, this morning, I'm going to offer you several reasons why that's taking place. And one reason that it's happening is we have gone from adversity to ease. And that makes a great difference with the nation. You see, when our forefathers came over here and they landed on these shores, you know what they saw? They saw land that was raw, untended, forced. It was hard. It was foreboding. It required great, great courage. It required sacrifice. It required vision. It demanded of men and women that they had something and they were willing to sacrifice all to get it. That's what it required. And if they didn't have that, they didn't make it. Have you ever read in history about some of these English gentlemen that got on the boat and sailed over to this country? Huh? Oh, they sailed over here. They got off the boat and they took one look at it and got on the boat and went back to England. You see, you can't, it didn't, it just didn't allow for people to be soft. It required people to have courage, to have fortitude, to be willing to do something. It required hard, hard work. Let me tell you something else it required. It required a community spirit. There wasn't any loners back then. These people that were loners back then didn't last. It, people had to work together. They had to pray together. And because they worked together and because they all were there working with one another, you find that it built strong families, and as a result of that, it built, built strong homes, and it built strong communities and strong towns, and we developed into a strong nation. Times have changed. No longer that way. Doesn't require much fortitude. Not much courage. In fact, you can really make it here in the United States and not do anything. We've come to that place. Life has gotten easy. You can go down to the supermarket, get about anything you want. You certainly don't have to grow it. You don't have to till the ground for it. Life is just pretty simple. All the modern conveniences of a home, and I look at that, and we call that hard work today. But I tell you, ladies, there happens to be a great, great difference between the washing machine today and the scrub board considerable a lot lot difference fellas between running a tractor and plowing with a horse it's different altogether we've come to a nation of ease we have a great deal of leisure free time and because of that people have lost their vision they don't see what they once saw Vision has perished, and the Scripture says that when people lose their vision, what happens? The people perish. We've got soft. You know how it is. Some of you men have come home to find a note like this from your wife. It says, honey, gone shopping. There's a TV dinner in the refrigerator. I'm sure you can manage. Love, Sue. And the husband gets the... TV dinner out of the refrigerator and manages. Sets down in front of TV, watches it. That is the situation. In many cases, we've become soft. We've gone from adversity 
to ease and the people have lost their vision. Not only do we have a problem of adversity to ease, but we've also gone from value to goals. We definitely as a nation have taken our eyes off of value and gone to goals. I can remember, some of you still can, when it was considered an honorable thing to give your employee an honest day's work. Boy, I can remember parents lectured their children that if you go to work for somebody, you give that person an honest day's work. You understood that that was right. You understood that before God you were to do that. But our eyes have been taken off of value and they have been moved to goals. A man by the name of Rene Nornbergen wrote a book here a couple years ago called The Death Cry of an Eagle. In it, he made this statement. The values upon which American civilization was built are being reconsidered and found wanting in many respects. Now listen carefully. Not only are time-honored virtues of hard work, thrift, self-discipline, self-reliance, sharply defined moral concepts, and love of family and country, taking a back seat, making room for corrupting vices and declining morals, but now, too, Americans are painfully aware of the shocking discovery that global power once thought to be the monopoly of the United States is fast slipping from this country's grasp. Oh, how true that is. You see, I remember when if two men shook hands, you didn't need a better contract than that. If that man said, listen, I'll do it, and he shook your hand, you didn't have to have anything in writing. Far as he was concerned, his life depended on it. He believed that. That was something that he stood for. He put great, great importance on the value of his word. What he said, he believed, and he did it. As Americans, we put great, great emphasis on value. That's the way the country was established. You remember, as well as I did, that you used to could buy something, and if it was stamped on the product, on the box, made in the United States of America, that you couldn't buy better quality anywhere in the world. Why? Because we put great, great importance on value. We said, if our name's going to be on it, it's going to be the best that you could buy, and we emphasize the value of it. But then the day came in which we moved to what was called assembly lines. We began to run things down assembly lines, and we weren't too much concerned of the quality as we were about how much came off the end of the line. How many of those can we put out in one day? That's what we became concerned with. We weren't really too concerned about the value of it, but how much we could melt the product for, how much we could get out of it. That's what we were concerned with. And I want to tell you, and I'm sorry to have to say it, that the American car market is suffering from that today. You know, they've told every one of you that you've got to buy a new one every year. Weren't really so concerned about the value and the quality of it is other than how many of those things we could make and how many we could talk the public into buying. Our whole concept went from, va from values to goals, and it changed the character of the nation. Not only have we gone from values to goals, but we've also gone from homes to houses. 
You see, when our forefathers came over here, you had to have a home. You couldn't have a house. If you just had a house, you didn't make it. You had to have a home. It was a place where the family unit was very close, very close-knit, and they had to be because, let me tell you, it took everybody working. It wasn't just the husband working or it wasn't just the wife working or it wasn't the husband and the wife working. It was the whole family working. Great, great difference. I don't know where you grew up. I don't know all of you. I happened to be taken out of one situation as a child and put out in the country in another situation, totally different. And let me tell you something. Did you ever hear about chores? I mean, it wasn't mom and dad worked. It was the whole family worked. Took us all. It required that to have a unit, a family like it should be. They understood clearly that this was necessary. They understood some things from Scripture. They understood that that father was responsible for that home. And let me tell you men here something. You're not responsible just for your work. You're not responsible just for the home. You're responsible for every detail of it. You happen to be the head of the house. That's what the Scripture says. And God holds you responsible for all of it. He understood that. He understood that he was responsible for that whole home, everything that went on there. He understood that he was to give to that home love. He was to give to that home protection. He was to give to that home food, livelihood. He understood that. That was his responsibility. The mother understood that she had a heavy responsibility, that she wasn't just to give to that home food on the table. She understood that she was to give nurture to that home, love. She understood that she controlled the atmosphere of that home. She understood that in the eyes of God, her responsibility to that home was the highest calling on earth. She understood that. And let me tell you, because that was the case, you find that we had very, very strong homes in this country. We not only had strong homes because those homes were solid units, it gave us strong towns. And as a result of that, we had extremely a strong country. Back in the days when Golda Meir was alive of Israel, her and President Nixon were talking one time. And as they were talking, she told him, she said, we have a country of very insecure borders, but very strong cities. And oh, how true that is. If you go over to Israel, you'll see that's very true. She said, you have a country of very strong borders, but very insecure cities. Why? Homes. You go over to Israel and you go out on some of those kibbutz and so forth, and I can tell you right quick, you can see that those family units are tight. I mean, they're strong. And we've gone from, house, from ho houses to not homes anymore, but we have houses where people come and they go, they meet one another, but there's not that tight unit. And because of that, dear friends, the divorce rate has rocketed in this country. Look at it. That's it for the world. You see where the United States is? Right at the top. We lead the world in divorce. Why? Because we've got husbands and wives that don't even know one another. They live in a house. They don't live in a home. 
They just sleep there and eat. They don't spend any time together. And as a result of it, our divorce rate has skyrocketed because we've moved away from what God's Word has to say. One other aspect I'd like to look at with you. You're going to have to think carefully now to understand what I'm saying. We've gone from spirituality to atheism. When our forefathers came over here, this country was established upon religious principles. Not that way today. I want you to listen to what the Scripture says. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a what? Lamb. He had two horns like a lamb. Do you know in the Bible what the lamb represents? Huh? It represents Jesus Christ. I want you to listen. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's talking about Jesus Christ as the lamb. Listen to one in Revelation. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy is the lamb. So when it says that it had two horns like a lamb, it meant that this country was Christ-like in character. That's what it was, Christ-like in character. Let me share some things with you right quick. You ever read about Christopher Columbus? Huh? You know who he was? All right. I want you to listen to what he said about the discovery of this country. It was the Lord who put it into my mind. He's talking about coming over here. He said, it was the Lord that put it into my mind. I could feel his hand upon me. The fact that it would be possible to sail from here to the Indies. All who heard of my project rejected it with laughter, ridiculing me. There is no question that the inspiration was from the what? The Holy Spirit, because he comforted me with rays of marvelous inspiration from the Holy Scripture. He believed that he was led by God in the discovery of this country. You ever heard of William Livingston? Huh? Well, he's one of the fellows that signed your Declaration of Independence. This is what he said. Courage, Americans. The finger of God points out a mighty empire to your sons. The savages of the wilderness were never expelled to make room for idolaters and slaves. The land we possess is the gift from heaven to our fathers, and divine providence seems to have decreed it to our latest posterity. The day dawns in which the foundation of a mighty empire is to be laid by the establishment of a regular American constitution. See, he believed that God had given them this, and those people came in here, they settled this country. Then problems developed between the United States and England. Our forefathers finally decided they wanted to be an independent nation. They signed the Declaration of Independence. War broke out with England. Let me tell you something. That war was terrible. You don't even comprehend what happened to those 13 colonies. It broke them. I mean, it bankrupt every one of them. That war so severed the lines of communication between those colonies that they didn't even know what one another was doing, that by the time the war was over, they were mad at one another because they felt they had been Forsaken, They felt they were all by themselves. It was terrible on this country. And when the war was finally over, and they called the Constitutional Congress in Boston, and they sent delegates from the 13 colonies there, 
They got there and they wound up in such an argument. I mean, just a big fight until finally the delegation from New York went home. And it looked like that whole Constitutional Congress was going to fall apart when a little man sitting over there with glasses on finally stood to his feet. His name was Benjamin Franklin. And he had this to say. We have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding. Listen carefully. In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible to danger, we had what? Daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. Do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs the affairs of men. Those men and women got down on their knees right there in that hall, and they prayed. And they got up off their knees and they put this nation together. You can talk all you want to. And they can go on all they want to about atheism and all that, dear friends. But I'm telling you that if we forsake what we once had, we're in trouble. Our forefathers believed that with all their hearts. And you go up to Washington, D.C. today and you walk through the halls of Congress and you go into the Capitol and through the parks and you find God written everywhere because they believed in him. It was part of their conviction when they elected the first president, George Washington. His inaugural speech, this is what he said. It would be particularly improper to admit in this first official act my fervent supplications to the almighty being who rules over the universe, who presides in the council of nations, and whose providential aids can supply every human defect, that his benediction may consecrate to thee liberties and the happiness of the people of the United States. Now listen very carefully to what he's saying. No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Every step by which we have advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. And dear friend, go back and read it. I mean, you can see the hand of God time and time and time and time and time again where he moved in and protected them against all odds. And he's saying, if nothing else, if they stood there that day and looked at it, they're bound to realize there's a God of heaven. And now he set up this nation. We ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smile of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. You see, our forefathers believed it with all their hearts. And dear friend, let me tell you something. I don't think you and I don't think I have the, response, the right to tell anybody how they have to believe. I believe when we get into telling them what they've got to believe, we are out of our place and everybody is. But I can tell you one thing I do think that you have the responsibility as men and women, as citizens of the United States, to make sure that the people you're voting for are ruling just and in the fear of God. I do believe that. This idea that we want to put somebody in office that doesn't believe in God and his whole standard of morals is based on some other thing than what you and I believe, I can tell you is not right. I get very concerned when I hear some of the things that I hear today. It bothers me when people want to talk about things and that as I can see this nation changing character 
because it says it had two horns like a lamb, but it says that it spoke like a what? A dragon. You know who the dragon is? Huh? Well, listen to what it says in Revelation. And the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So when it says that it was like a lamb and it spoke as a dragon, it says that it has changed its character, that it has gone from spirituality to atheism. And it bothers me, it bothers me a great deal when I read about schools in this country where they won't even let a child check a Bible out of the library until he's 17 years old. That bothers me. It bothers me when we want to pass laws telling children that they can't pray in school or a teacher can't pray in school. That bothers me. And don't misunderstand me. I don't think I have any right forcing my belief on somebody else. But I don't want people that have no belief telling me what I'm going to do. I'll tell you that for sure. The time has come, dear friend, where you and I must run and understand that I've got to stand up for what I believe in God. I'm not going to go out here and tell somebody else, you've got to believe this and you've got to act a certain way. But boy, they're not going to tell me that I've got to believe what they want to believe. I'm going to believe what I think that I should believe as the Holy Spirit dictates to my conscience. And that's where you and I need to stand. We've been sold a bill of goods. We keep yelling, oh, let's keep church and state separated. Sure, we need to. But that doesn't mean we've got to give up our belief. That doesn't mean we need to take and turn this country into atheistic beliefs. Doesn't mean that a bit. It bothers me when I go out here and visit some of our national parks and some guide takes me for a tour and he wants to tell me how this world came into existence by evolution and how it evolved and not a word of, of creation is mentioned. That bothers me a great deal. It's high time that we wake up we understand that this nation came into existence by the hand of God. And we need to keep it that way. There's a text over in 2 Chronicles that says this, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, we have a little trouble with that. But we need to humble ourselves. We need to realize that we've gotten a long way from what we once were. We need to humble ourselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. Oh, dear friend, that's what we need to do. We need to come back to God. Sure, the Bible says that it's going to change character. But you and I ought to be doing everything that we can do to stay close to the Lord Jesus Christ to follow him. God says, if, he will, if we will, that he will bless this nation. This nation was a nation under God. I hope, by the grace of God, we'll keep it that way. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to thee today realizing, Lord, that we've gone a long ways from what we should be. We come, Lord, realizing that we've sinned. We come, Lord, asking that you'll forgive us. Today, Lord, we remember the president of our country. We ask, Lord, that you'll bless him Give him wisdom. Give him understanding. Oh, there's times, Lord, when he has to make decisions that no one else can make, only he. And we pray that in those times, Lord, that he may turn unto you, seek thy face, 
thy guidance. We ask, Lord, that you'll bless the governors of our states, our senators, our representatives. We pray, Lord, that this nation may get, again be a nation that's under God. May each of us stand firmly for that which is right. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. God bless each one of you. We hope you can be with us at 11. If not, tonight, have a nice day.